Namaste. Hello, everyone. Let's start healing. I'm Adrienne Murchison, and thank you for returning to our Let's Start Healing podcast. This is a very special episode 15, and it very much fits with what we like to say here, and that is we have more in common than we think, and what we have in common can change the world. This episode focuses on the Netflix miniseries, When They See Us, which is the story of the men who came to be known as the Central Park Five. And I have been wanting to uh, talk to folks about this miniseries for the last few weeks. Uh, This came about for me after watching the miniseries and talking to members of my family. And there was a little divide in our family because uh, one mindset is uh, this is a must-see uh, miniseries. This is a must-see, as hard as, as it is to watch. And then uh, another mindset is it's too hard to watch. It's just too much. It's just too emotional. So I realized, I came to realize that this same dialogue was taking place in the media and online. So today we have uh, four gentlemen here and we're going to talk about it. I am taking it for granted that uh, most of our listeners uh, do know the story of the Central Park jogger. Uh, She was brutally raped in 1989 in Central Park in New York City. And uh, five teenagers, uh, five uh, boys were uh, arrested and um, convicted of this crime. And um, they did not do it. Their conviction was overturned in 2002. And in 2014, they were awarded $41 million in a civil rights lawsuit against New York City. So we're going to talk to, as I said, our guests today. And let me introduce you to them. We have John Murchison, who lives in Chesapeake, Virginia. And he happens to be my nephew. He is not the same nephew that you met a few weeks ago. John is a calibration technician at a Virginia naval shipyard. He's married in a family of four. And as a black man in America, when they see us landed uh, in a certain way for him. And also he has a young son who is... Um, who he thought about as he was watching the miniseries. So he's going to share a little bit with us about that. Bruce Brooks is with us. He is a videographer and journalist here in Atlanta. Bruce is actually working on a documentary on African-Americans and their African roots and how um, we are connected and disconnected uh, often Uh, when it comes to this, when it comes to African roots. He is very well read on the Central Park Five case. And um, having said that, he does not have a desire to watch when they see us. So Bruce will talk with us about that. We also have Owen Janeway. And Owen is a retired IT professional from the financial services industry. He um, is someone that I interviewed early last year for a news story on a um, discussion group called Healing the Racial Divide. And this discussion group brings together people of all different ethnicities and uh, who want to get to know people. They want to get to know um, people who don't come from the same backgrounds. And this group came together right after the 2016 presidential election as a way to counter the divisiveness that arose at that time. We also have Chirag Patel, and he is an academic advisor in higher education. He is of South Asian descent and practices the Hindu faith. And as a man of color, he has a very interesting perspective on um, race here in the U.S. 
So um, before we get started, I want to say that uh, each of these uh, men chatted with Let's Start Healing from different locations. So the sound may be different from one to the other, but you will still enjoy uh, the podcast. So let's get started. Let's meet them and let's start healing. When I heard Ava DuVernay was creating a mini series, or at the time, which I thought was a documentary and realized was a mini series on the Central Park Five, I thought about, you know, what I knew about the case and everything that had gone on. And in my mind, I just knew that it was five young guys that were wrongfully accused of a crime they didn't commit. I didn't understand the nuances of it or anything of that nature. So once I did see the series, um, I learned the depth and the detail of the story. Um, I didn't know of false confessions or anything of that nature. So it was a really eye opening mini series. Uh, all four parts were hard to watch, um, but I was deeply <clears throat> moved by the Corey Wise story, um, not to diminish any of the other stories, but his is the one that resonated with me the most um, because I had seen the Khalif Browder story. And so it gave me a new perspective on prison and what that can do to a person's mind. Um, in contrast, you can see that Corey Wise was able to to get out of that situation where he may have been, you know, bruised or scarred, but he looked at life as a positive thing and he's able to continue and move on. Um, <clears throat> I've known a lot about, you know, the criminal justice system just because I was reading as a young man and I too have experienced various situations, whether it's being pulled over by the police or being profiled in public. And the one thing that I always, well, that always resonated with me is the best thing to do is to not get involved with the criminal justice system, which means don't get arrested, don't have a record, things of that nature, if at all possible. Um, in this situation, that wasn't the case. Um, these men were obviously in a situation where I wouldn't necessarily just say wrong place, wrong time, but for lack of a better term, that's what it seemed to be. Um, I believe Ava DuVernay did a wonderful job with this documentary, telling the story from their perspective. In various interviews that I've seen, she said that she was telling it from a biased point of view because their stories had never been heard. And as you watch it, you can appreciate that because a lot of times when people are victimized, they don't have the power to tell the story and grab people the way that other people do. And that's just a gift that Ava DuVernay has. She has the ability of hearing a story, interpret, interpreting that story empathizing with the people involved and bringing it to life as she sees it. Um, so I definitely don't have a problem with her having a biased point of view. Um, it's interesting that a lot of the guys, except for Corey, basically four of the five guys, except for Corey Wise, moved out um, of New York City. I always looked at New York City as a place where I would never want to raise my son or even have to grow up. And that's not to knock New York City, but when you see Rikers Island, when you hear the stories and things that come out of that, um, it's it's a place where it's really hard to instill certain things in a child and then expect them to go out, live their lives as grown men when they're still kids. Um, when I watch this story, it's still painful. I don't feel like the men are vindicated because they just lost so many years off of their lives. Uh, in addition to that, they had to be registered sex offenders. So in that itself, once they were free, they weren't really free. Um, it's a hard, a hard story to watch, <clears throat> but it's necessary for everyone who's of age and not necessarily impressionable and can take that kind of content to watch it. It's an important piece of work for young black men to see as well because or men of color in general, but definitely young men of color to see and understand that this thing can just go wrong at any moment. You can just be riding with your friends, having a good time, listening to music. And you know, at that age, you're full of testosterone. You're ready to just have fun. But at the same time, you're on edge. Unfortunately, you may be ready to fight. But that thing can turn into something totally different. And I just pray that as time goes on, people understand that 
you know, when you see a person of color and they're like 16, 17 years old, no matter how big they may be, man, it's still a kid. And I hope that we can just get to a place in America where we have more equality. Um, the main thing I want to say about this documentary is she did a wonderful job portraying, well, miniseries, I'm sorry. She did a wonderful job portraying um, all of the characters. I know everybody isn't necessarily exactly, all the actors weren't exactly like the people who were uh, being portrayed, but she did a wonderful job humanizing them and making you feel like you knew these men. And even to this day, when you see these men on different award shows or see them in different videos, you feel like you know them and you know their story. And that's the most beautiful part about it. So, Bruce, <laughs> <laughs> I know that you decided not to watch When They See Us. However, you did see the Ken Burns documentary. Right. I did see the documentary. And... Um, I'm actually working on a documentary myself, so I understand that our people as African Americans, we have to be entertained. So what Ava DuVernay did was she dramatized it because most people never saw the documentary because we like drama. I mean, what we, makes you think that most people? She said it on NPR. She said that most people did not see the documentary. Well, in her discussion, she said, you know, she brought it to life because a lot of people were, weren't aware of the facts. Mm -hmm. And that goes with a conversation with people that I've had in my industry that and, and most of us didn't watch the, the series um, when they see us because, well, if you watch the documentary, you know, the facts, you know, the facts. But a lot of us like we have to be entertained to get information. Um, I forgot the rapper's name who said edutainment. We have to be edutained. So when you have information, you have to entertain us as well as inform us. And I'm not one of those people. So when I saw the documentary, I saw it. Plus I had read about it to death on the internet, but mm -hmm. we don't kind of do that. So I don't need the, the drama to be informed of something that I know already. You know, I don't need an actor to act out what I saw the people who actually went through it say on the Ken Burns documentary. So, you know, what was interesting uh, to me? And before I say that, I wonder what you mean about entertained. And we can get to that in a second, because I don't think you necessarily mean it in the way of the typical meaning of entertained. So I want to get to that. I don't know, but okay. I want to make a comment. Um, the final episode of the miniseries focuses on Corey Wise. Right. It is really heart-wrenching and really powerful. Right. So I saw Yousef in an interview. It wasn't only him. And I've seen so many interviews since, you know, in the last couple of weeks, it's hard to remember which one. Right. But he was saying that the miniseries, watching the miniseries, right. they learned that they had been thinking that they all experienced the same thing. So they were enlightened. Right. The five were enlightened or the other four were enlightened by the miniseries right. and seeing what Corey experienced. Right. You know, each person thought, well, what I went through, everybody went through. Right. So to me, that speaks to something, you know, a new awareness that comes from this miniseries. But I don't need that. I don't need his experience to know that we're in a really jacked up situation. Mm -hmm. I don't need to. Ex I'm not a very emotional person. Mm -hmm. So the, I don't need the emotions or I don't need to know that, oh, we experience something different or whatever to know that we're in a situation that we really need to fix. Mm -hmm. I don't need to know his feelings. I don't need to know what, you know, everybody learned or whatever. Like, for instance, if I watched the documentary and I sat with my friends and smoking a cigar, just the documentary, we get different things out of the documentary. Mm -hmm. So everybody is going to get something different, even even, you know, even people who have been through a situation will get something different once they sit down and talk about it. OK, but I don't need that. I understand. I don't I don't need that. And I'm not knocking anybody who did who does. I just know that 
um, I listened to Ava du- DuVernay on NPR mm-hmm. and she was talking about, she had seen the documentary and the reason she broke it up into four parts and ex- extended it and whatever. And there were some good things that came out of it or whatever. But what I got was that, well, a lot of people missed the facts period because they didn't watch the documentary. They didn't read about it. There's about a thousand articles on, on it. Like the Atlanta, Atlanta monthly Newsweek or whatever. And if you just read all of those, but you know, to extend the stereotype, we don't read a lot. So I had read all of those. I had seen, I had read Well, um, I think interviews. people don't read a lot. I'm right. going to argue that that's not exclusive to Well, especially this generation. Folks. But no, we generally don't just talk, we don't read a lot. So, I disagree. Um, <laughs> I'm not asking you. <laughs> well, go ahead. I'm telling you go what ahead. I think. Okay. But so, uh, we don't read a lot. And I had read extensively, especially after the, the, the documentary. Once mm-hmm. the documentary came out, it's like I spent a whole day. It's like some days at home, I'll play, you know, Gil Scott Heron all day. Well, mm-hmm. the next day for me was, let me find all the articles I can find on the Central Park Five I can find. Mm-hmm. And I did. So, like I said, you know, Atlanta Monthly, Time, Newsweek, in different interviews people did with, with all five of them. Some of them concentrated on one person. And even in the documentary, you will see the, the guy, there was one guy, I think he lived in D.C. He, he wasn't really a part and he came around at the end. So they're all individuals and you talk to their, their families and whatever. And some of the articles talk to their different families. So you got the emotional, you got the financial, you got the, the mental, you got everything. So if you cross referenced all this, I don't need to watch the series. And you know what? I respect that. I respect that. I think if I go through something not like this, let's say it's something totally different, but it's uh, traumatic and I come Mm -hmm. out the other side and there's a lot of public interest around it. And maybe I might feel I'm not speaking for anybody Mm -hmm. except myself. I might feel as it's not a matter of whether a person needs to watch it, Mm -hmm. it might be a matter of me wanting a person to watch it because that's my story. And I want you to, uh, to really have a visual, uh, you know, a, a picture of, you know, a mental image of what I experienced. I don't know if it's a matter of whether the person needs to see it or not. So, but I do respect, I completely respect that you don't. I do have to add this. Uh I do have to add this. Mm -hmm. Working in TV myself, Mm -hmm. I don't trust the media. I don't trust TV. So it's like, I love the fact. Now, this is the fact that I love. I love Ava DuVernay being the producer director. I love that. This is very different Mm -hmm. Um, because most of our stories you know, like one of the best things that have ever been on TV about black people is documentary is by Ken Burns, a white guy. We never get to tell our stories. So I never, I, I never like, like for instance, the James Brown movie, mm-hmm. the James Brown family members said it was a nice story, but that wasn't really, you know, it was, it was dramatized for them to make movies, make right. people go see movies. So working in the media I'm not inclined to watch things on TV because I know it has to be green lighted. Mm -hmm. I know it has to be approved. I know it has to be edited for television or whatever. So I just, that's just me personally. I understand you're skeptical. I'm very skeptical Mm -hmm. about people telling somebody else's story. Mm -hmm. And so I've, I've learned to do my own story in my head about anything. So, um, Thank you for talking about this. <laughs> and I would like to know what you are willing to share about your documentary. And go ahead. <laughs> My documentary is a lot about what I just said. Um, how the media has shaped what we think about ourselves and the resulting actions that we have with ourselves about what we believe about ourselves. Like people don't even understand why they do what they do. Uh So we spend money we don't have to impress people we don't even know Mm -hmm. because we don't feel good enough about ourselves. Mm -hmm. We have been devalued for hundreds of years about who we are. So that's why we do things to, to support our image versus our power or wealth. Mm -hmm. 
Like we, and we don't even know why we do this. Mm -hmm. And so if you line up the, and, and so I, what I do, what I want to do is line up the, the centuries of things that we have been told about ourselves mm -hmm. that we dismiss, but are still there. Mm -hmm. No, I understand. I understand. So, um, one, I want you to tell people how to get in touch with you, but I want to go back to, if you want, mm -hmm. <laughs> and okay. then I want to go back to, um, uh, the men known as the Central Park Five and just, if you could just briefly just capture how that impacts you, their story as a, as a black man. Well, what I'm doing with the documentary is I'm doing a promo and then I am going, I've done, this is my second documentary and I took money from the wrong person on the first one mm -hmm. and they gained pretty much control of it. Um, and so I don't have any rights to that documentary and mm -hmm. I won't say who I got the money from, but if I, it's, it's a huge name, but they got control of it. So it went from an hour long, it was about the Tuskegee experiment, mm -hmm. the syphilis thing, whatever. Mm -hmm. And it became politicized and whatever, because we took the money from a political person. And so this time what I'm going to do is I am going to, um, do like a fundraiser. Like a GoFundMe, but mm -hmm. I'm going to go to Indiegogo. So look for that. My name is Bruce Brooks, and I haven't set up the page yet. So, but I, when when I do, I'll send you the information. Okay. Um, as far as the Central Park Park Five, um, with everything that's happening in the country, it was just kind of, and I don't want to, you know, I don't want to minimize anything, but it was kind of like more of the same. It was kind of like when somebody, what was the Central Park? You Park mean Five, in 1989 or? What when they when were it exonerated when it happened, or and then when the document? Because I remember when it happened. Mm -hmm. I remember when Me it happened. Me too. I was living there. Um, and I remember the documentary, and it was just like for me, it was like confirmation of I already know. I already know this. Mm -hmm. um, because for every Central Park Five, there are about a thousand people out there who are living that no more than a thousand people. Um, the only thing that happened recently is we got cell phones with cameras on them, and we got social media. Mm -hmm. Without those things, they, we would never know anything about Sandra right. Bland. We wouldn't know anything about Central Park Five. We wouldn't know any of this. So, um, it's a horrible story. Mm -hmm. But there are about a there were there there are like tens of thousands of those horrible stories out there. Agreed. Yeah. So not to minimize them, and God bless them for telling their stories, because a lot of people have been shamed into not telling their stories. That's the other thing. Mm -hmm. Or they're mm -hmm. scared. Mm -hmm. They're scared because if you if it happens in a small town, let's say something happens in like an Alabama or Mississippi, you're scared to tell that story because I I know of a story where they they were like we don't they want to tell their story. Yeah, but then this I I don't have the words to to say how powerful I think this story is Terribly. and that it was beyond, I don't know. It's, it's something divine for me that mm -hmm. they have been exonerated and that they are this continue, they continue to be in the public eye. And I heard um, one of them talking about depositions that are sealed that will come out you know, in so many as years, in so many yeah, years. Yeah. and that we're going to see, we're going to receive even more information about the prosecutors since they were exonerated and not right. wanting to be honest. If I'm, oh, you know, yeah. just, there's just even more to come. I just, yes. even though this is, it's not, it's a common story and it's, it's, uh, they're not the only ones who experienced this. It doesn't mean that we we should still tell a story. Right. We should still spotlight, you know, who we can as often as we can. Having worked again, I work in broadcast media, and I have interviewed like the Innocence Project. Mm -hmm. You can go on in Facebook or right. and whatever. I have interviewed, I know four of those guys for different shows. Four of for the people who've been released because of the Innocence project oh, uh -huh. um i actually worked worked behind the scenes on the movie the wrong demand mm -hmm. um with the guy i can never say his name his last name is ali um, <laughs> um he was on uh luke cage um but talking and, 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 and 
I'm skeptical of TV because of what I know outside I of television. Uh -huh. Because the good conversations happen when the cameras go off. Right. And so some of their stories, um, there was one guy, he, he, he basically spent all of his money. He got like $14 million or something. Or no, $1.4. Anyway, anyway, he spent most of his money helping other guys that he knew were innocent mm -hmm. and I can't be mad at him. And, and it, you, you would watch TV and be like, well, why is he broke? Cause he got 1.4 million. He's like, I had to spend that money right. to help these guys get out because I know they were innocent. Wow. You, you have me, in, uh, we're going to end here, but now you got me <laughs> thinking about Khalif Browder. Oh, I can't even, <laughs> uh, I can't even, <laughs> Oh you no, know, I, tr I tried to watch the the now that I tried to watch on Netflix. I got through one episode. And I was like, I can't do it. Yeah, that's I can't do it. I, I needed would say I needed a shot. Uh, yeah, and, and and another shot and a glass of wine. That was that's another heartbreaking story. Yeah. Heartbreaking. Yeah. Cruel. Okay, Bruce Brooks. <laughs> thank you so much. <laughs> My pleasure. So welcome, Owen. Thank you. I really it's appreciate nice, it. It's nice to be here. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. I, I so appreciate you being here. And you mentioned that you all have not um, uh, discussed the miniseries yet uh, when they see us. Right. Uh, but you're aware of the series. Uh, I am. And, and um, did you say that you watched it or mm -hmm. you plan to watch it? Uh, I, I watched the second episode. Uh-huh. Um, because And a friend of mine we had to, we had talked about it and we we'd agreed to watch it together uh but we were going to watch start watching it and and <laughs> she she watched the first episode but I didn't oh okay <laughs> um, yeah you know, it, it's uh, a challenge to to me to uh uh to undertake it because I know it's going to make me uh, upset mm -hmm, mm -hmm. i'm familiar enough with the case right. that uh, um you know i know it's not going to be a fun um, fun ride right <laughs> so what did you think of the episode that you watched well the second one is the one that i watched uh -huh. about the trial uh -huh. and um <clears throat> and i i guess it reminds me of a suspicion i've had for for a long time that that our criminal justice system uh is deeply flawed in a lot of ways mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and knowing how much is uh is difficult to uh, discern mm -hmm. uh from the from my perspective as a citizen, but but you see enough news accounts yeah. uh, over over the years of where um, uh, d the uh, prosecutor's offices ha have suppressed evidence mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. and or after convictions, particularly in uh, in the cases of the innocence projects trying to right. address uh, the uh, people who've who've been convicted of. of of crimes and sentenced mm -hmm. to death and those litigations going on for literally decades, mm -hmm. you know, someone sitting on death row exactly. for 20 years and you've got the prosecutor's department sitting on evidence that, that, that could clear those, exactly. those people. Mm -hmm. And it gives you, I mean, if you think about it, it gives you a sense of uh, a kind of flaw that's in our, justice system that's insidious uh, mm -hmm. it's it's going to, you know it undermines our our confidence as citizens mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. of uh in our own criminal justice right. system right 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 and 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 similarly the the incidences of police shootings and uh those kinds of things that uh that we've seen more recently mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh kind of confirm your suspicion that uh, there's there's things going on that are inappropriate, mm -hmm. and, and it's not professional of our law enforcement services to be shooting people in the back. Right, right. <clears throat> well, so what? What? Do, how do you find the climate among the people that you talk to? Because race is is up in our <clears throat> in our face all the time in the media. Sure. So how do you find that? Well, it, it's it's difficult and it's it's frustrating that uh, to to me that um, there's such a you call it a divide, I guess, mm -hmm. in the way that uh, uh, white people in particular view view those things. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, there there are um, the 
in the case of the police shootings, you've got um, um, the tendency on the part of some people to think that, well, there's the the victim must have done something. Right. You know, he did something to agitate the policeman. Mm-hmm. Or, you know, didn't follow orders, and mm-hmm. there's something outside the frame of mm-hmm. these. Yet we've seen what dozens of them, right? That right, uh, and you know, so you have to, you know, a, an objective person uh, to me needs to uh, look at those things a little mm-hmm. bit a little more suspiciously. Mm-hmm. Sure, mm-hmm. you know, one-off incidences may happen, but uh, right, come on, at least say this is too much. This is. You know, there, there's a lot of these, mm-hmm. and then uh, those are only incidentally caught on someone's cell phone. It's mm-hmm. not that that we have a complete picture of what's going on. Right, so, right. So it kind of undermines my confidence in, in our criminal justice system, but, uh, mm-hmm. but yet, you know, there's a significant uh, portion of society that looks at those things and and has a yes, but kind of... Right. Um, uh, response or reaction to it. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, <clears throat> mm-hmm. Do you see the climate getting any better, or that's that's a tough one, Adrian. <laughs> <laughs> I I can't say that I do, but uh-huh. uh, uh, it's it's it, it's a concern. But I, I guess I don't see a mm-hmm. lot of lot of movement, and that's deeply troubling to me so um going back to this um story of when they see us and the men who were known as the central park five now the exonerated five what did you know about that um that case and that story from were you aware of it from from the the beginning beginning? Mm -hmm. yes i heard about it on the news at the time i I think it was in the 90s i think Mm -hmm. 1989 89 Mm -hmm. yeah so so there was a a good bit of news reporting about it Mm -hmm. And um, um, I was suspicious because I heard, uh, you know, the the claims on the part of the defense that uh, uh, they were questioning whether the the uh, defendants were even there and that Mm -hmm. kind of thing. But but at the same time, it was in a high crime period Mm -hmm. uh, and there was a lot of discussion of the gang violence and that kind of thing. So. Uh, you don't know what to think about it, so it's one of those uh, highly reported incidences. Mm-hmm. And you know, uh, being yeah. busy with my career at the time, uh, you're not quite sure what what to think about mm-hmm. it. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> yeah, and then as time goes on, you know, the story starts changing, and we start becoming more enlightened and right. find out that they actually didn't do it. And I think a lot of us, I, I talk about this. I mean, I just assume that they were guilty because they had confessed. Yeah. But then, you know, as time went on, sure, sure, you know, yeah. we learn more. Yeah. I, don't, I don't remember uh, the fact that that they confessed at the time. Oh, okay. You know, uh-huh. it was just a reporting. So that that mm-hmm. came out later that we well, uh-huh. confessed to it and um and but in watching the the episode mm-hmm. of when they see us uh, you know it it reminded me of of my own experiences and being on juries oh really um and and I haven't been on a jury where the defendant was black you have or you have not I have not uh-huh so but um it it did remind me of the tendency I think that that we have to think a person's when, guilty. When, yeah, uh-huh. uh, you know when you if you're in a in a trial you're sitting there and and you've got the state with the mm-hmm. judge, the prosecutor, mm-hmm. the police, uh, all of the uh, represent representatives right. of right. the state against. One person, the accused, right? <laughs> yeah, and and typically in the in the in the juries I've been on, the the prosecuting attorney is very accomplished, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. the defense attorney is less less so. Mm-hmm. So, <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. so uh, if you if you haven't been on a jury, uh, you tend to think, well, gee, we have a really really fair uh, trial system, don't we? You know, you have to be uh, convicted unanimously, you know, twelve people have to decide that uh, that you're guilty of something. Mm-hmm. Uh, but there's a there's a strong tendency um, in my my experience to 
for jurors to accept the state's argument. Yes. And, you know, speaking of at that time of that of that case, I was living in New York mm-hmm. and um, I was at, at the time of the. Yeah. The Central uh-huh. Park. Mm-hmm. Yes. And I worked at a big company and I remember um, one of my coworkers was on jury duty yeah. and we were around the same age and she was a person of color. Mm-hmm. And um, I remember when she got back, it was a rape trial yeah. and um, the the. Um, Defendant was black Mm -hmm. and she did not think that he had he had committed the crime, but she went along with the guilty verdict Mm -hmm. because she felt pressure. And I just I was I still can't get over that. Sure, sure. (laughs) I still can't get over it. Yeah. So Um, it's something. Well, you you do encounter that Mm -hmm. in in the in being on a jury. There is pressure. Especially if it's predominantly, if, if a majority of the uh-huh. group thinks the person is guilty, right? Then, then you're on the spot trying to defend the person. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, and as I said, my my experience wasn't uh, was of white right uh, defendants, right, so that right. wasn't the issue. But, yeah, but, but still, I you know it it was a challenge to look at what the state was putting forth for, mm-hmm. for me when when I had, you know, s- sort of a, an ingrained distrust of, mm-hmm. of the criminal justice system. Mm-hmm. 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 Um, an ingrained dr- distrust. Right. Uh-huh. Just, just based on yeah. uh, over my lifetime uh-huh. seeing uh, the kinds of uh, – Issues that come uh, come so out it's of just, people being falsely convicted, right? Uh, even even convicted and sentenced to death. Wow! Uh, around circumstances that turn out to be uh, later to mm-hmm. have been false. So this is just in your DNA. Like this is just the way you're built. Like you just care about these things. Is that the? Is that right? Yeah, well, since I, you were I, since you were young, I well, mean, you know, like a, I, I a, think a young I boy came, came of age. Uh huh. And and. Followed the news and uh-huh. uh, that that kind of thing and it, yeah so I'm I'm not sure specifically what what causes me to mistrust the it's uh-huh. it's not you know I'm a fairly establishment kind of person uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, well but, what I mean but like it, what but ma- it's it's this I I guess it's just a a an, a sense that power corrupts mm-hmm. and you always have to be suspicious of right uh, of people in powerful positions mm-hmm. and and particularly where there's uh, where they're under the public spotlight right like in political situations mm-hmm. you know I think as citizens we we have to be uh, on on our toes all the time right and to look suspiciously at right uh, at things that are being put forth to us. Yeah. So. And, and I, and I, my question was, was also just the caring now, in addition to mistrust, but caring, you know, about other, uh, ethnicities and cultures and, and, uh, <laughs> because I think a lot of people think they just don't have to care. This doesn't affect me, you know, so sure, this is yeah. not my problem. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. I, I remember, uh, during the civil rights era, uh-huh. when, when I was growing up, there was there was a a strong sense or opinion among uh, our mostly white community mm-hmm. that uh, why are these people causing all this trouble? Mm. You know, the civil rights protesters, <laughs> and so so people like Martin Luther King and Malcolm X and uh, all got lumped into a bucket of. Uh, just agitators. And uh-huh. Why are they doing this? This right. is, you know, where everything is fine. Mm-hmm. Uh, why are you trying to ruffle the <laughs> feathers? Why, why are they stirring <laughs> up trouble? To change everything. Yeah. You know, why are they mm-hmm. stirring up all this trouble? You know, when everything is That's fine. Amazing. Mm-hmm. Um, that was kind of the sense, mm-hmm. but but it's the same. And 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 I think I bought that to some extent at the time. But, mm-hmm. but as I grew older, and followed uh, the news more closely then mm-hmm. then that kind of tended to chip away right. at, that, at that narrative that that there's nothing going on there there's no reason right. why these folks should be upset right 
Right. And I, I want to say that um, when I had talked to you last year, something really um, stood out for me. We were talking about the dis- the uh, racial discussion groups that you're involved in. And you mentioned that um, the, ch- the challenge for you and I and I think a lot of people don't do this. That is to when something comes up, if you're in a conversation with someone and they bring up a remark, a disparaging remark um, about black people or other people of color, the thing that you were taking upon yourself to do is to to call them on it without creating an argument, because it could be an argument. Sure. Yeah. Every day you mentioned. Yeah. And uh, can you speak to that? Yes. It's, um, you know, it's something as, as a white person, I feel like. I have some responsibility to to address those kinds of situations because because it's deeply cultural uh-huh. and it's embedded in the uh, in our own own mind, all of us. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. I mean, I can I can think of instances where where uh, where I I'm suspicious of a mm-hmm. a minority, right? You know claiming that they were wrong somehow, Mm -hmm. you know, I mean, we all do it, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. uh, but, uh, uh, but there comes a a point where the evidence is pretty, pretty overwhelming that there's something else going on other than just some malcontent (laughs) (laughs) trying to raise, (laughs) stir up trouble Mm -hmm. and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Um, And, and, you know, the fact that it is such an issue in our society, Mm -hmm. um, and it's so pervasive. I, I think it's doing and has done tremendous damage to the country, and uh, and continues to do that. So and you, so you, I I feel this obligation to um, when I'm among my own race mm-hmm. and I hear those kinds of things to somehow uh, bring up the other side or that mm-hmm. there's another viewpoint. But that's extremely difficult to do, in in, in my experience, because it often just descends into, uh, well, you know, that's your view. This is mine. You know, mm-hmm. there's two ways to look at this. Right, and, right, right. Um, and I don't really feel like I'm making a lot of progress in changing hearts and minds right. out there. Yeah. I'd like to, I, I'd like to but. Right. <laughs> and you know, but, it's funny mm. because, uh, I, I say to my, I'm an idealist. I'm a, and, I'm and a realist am, and, and an idealist. I, yeah. I'm a realist, but, but. <laughs> And, and deep down, I'm an idealist. Yes. You know, I want things to be. Yeah. <laughs> and I think that that um, even in this community, you know, here, you know, in the city of Sandy yeah. Springs, I feel that it is we can't change people's minds. I feel I feel people aren't going to change their minds by um, words. You know, although we use words and I will continue to use words, but really it's by getting to know each other. I think that's the only way that people really, you know, come to a realization of, you know, in their spirit of, you know what? I was wrong about that. You know, that's not true what I thought. Yeah. But it's a matter of, you know, wanting to get to know somebody who doesn't look like you or look like me. You you know what I mean? Yes. Yeah. Yes. I, I, I. Totally agree. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's, I, I guess, the conclusion that I've come to that um, I'm not going to be able to argue someone out of their exactly. viewpoint on, right. on race. Mm-hmm. That it has to uh, take, that has to happen some other way. Right, right. And, and you know, and I, I think um, a, a one thing that I've observed is that there are enough families now, and white families, with with children of color or grandchildren Uh and where you see that situation you you often see a very different viewpoint Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. toward race Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and sometimes so so sometimes (laughs) when when there's someone in your life uh, or someone you know well and care about care about there's a different color then you have more compassion will will probably change your viewpoint quicker Mm -hmm. than anything that anyone can say to right them. right right uh, so I, I really agree with that That's... yeah <clears throat> well you're in two discussion groups uh that that address race can you share that, that? that's Show correct us. uh i've been involved for a couple of years now in a group called healing the racial divide mm-hmm. uh, that was uh, formed by uh the son of an acquaintance a friend of mine mm-hmm. um and they're uh 
uh, non-faith-based, uh, uh, but discuss, focus on discussions of about race and mm-hmm. what's going on in the community and uh, the country. Um, the the group got started, I think, in response to some of the uh, uh, police shootings mm-hmm. uh, that we've seen. Was you that know, before last... I became aware of it? Like after the um, 2016 election, was it, it started before it, it, then? It sta- no, it started right after then. Okay, <clears throat> mm-hmm. and and I think that was part of the motivation as well. I think uh, you know, there's a general uh, shock at mm-hmm. uh, what was going on in the country politically, and uh, mm-hmm. and particularly on top of what what uh, uh, we saw in these clips right uh, of police shootings and so right on. you seem passionate about it even talking uh, about it now sure. what does that bring up for you what do you what is your thoughts around all of that well uh yeah it, it's <clears throat> it's very disturbing having mm-hmm. you know i grew up in the 60s and lived through the uh the civil rights era mm-hmm. and uh, here in atlanta or where? uh it was in east tennessee actually oh, uh-huh and we it was a predominantly white area but uh mm-hmm. but of course all, all of those things were on the news right and i guess over the years subsequently to the 60s you know you get the sense that we're making progress and of we've course. put those things behind us mm-hmm. um and uh, uh then some of the Things we've seen more recently, though, have called that into question. Right, you know, right. <laughs> you know, so I, I still believe we've made progress. We're mm-hmm. not, we're not back in the segregationist area, right? Era, right? Uh, but uh, still, uh, it, it, it's kind of disturbing to see us kind of sliding back in that direction. It and is. I think uh, uh, that's part of the motivation. Uh, it, it's part of mine, mm-hmm. uh, and, pro- and I'm sure. Uh, of other people that mm-hmm. are uh, participating in these kinds of groups. And uh, uh, Healing the Racial Divide is because I've, I attended a meeting for a, a story um, early last year, I think. Uh-huh. And um, that's a very mixed group yes, uh, yes. Of, of black right. and white and yes. um, other other ethnicities. Right. And then there's another group that you're a part of with your church. Yes, yes. We have a uh, I'm a, I'm a member of Sandy Springs Christian Church, mm-hmm. uh, which is the denomination uh, for that mm-hmm. uh, church is uh, the Disciples of Christ. Uh huh. Um, and we're and the churches are typically called Christian churches. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, they have a uh, a racial reconciliation ministry within the denomination. Wow. Mm-hmm. And uh, we are. Uh, similar to healing the racial divide, mm-hmm. uh, having discussions about what's going on mm-hmm. in society and how does that, uh, how, how does our our faith uh, challenge us to to look at those kinds of things? Right, and I was, um, and that that uh, group is mostly white, right? Because uh, our, it, our particular church yeah. is, yes. And I, the reason mm-hmm. I bring that up is because it that was just so. Um, heartening really to 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 be aware of a group that is mostly white and yes. is the members are saying we don't like you know what, the temperature of what's what's happening what, here what we're seeing uh-huh. is, is is a concern right right uh, and part part of the part of our activities involves um coordinating or uh, working with other churches in the metro area from, mm-hmm. in the Decatur and T- Tucker area. And okay. One of those churches is uh, uh, the Ray of Hope mm-hmm. uh, Christian Church is uh, is predominantly black. Okay. Well. So okay. Uh, so since we're you know part of part of the effort has to be coming together as, right. as two races and you know being predominantly white. <laughs> You know that's hard to do. Yeah, so. yeah. <laughs> so. Are there are there any things that you've seen people become more enlightened about, or? Uh... Well, yes. There's there's encour- it's encouraging uh, mm-hmm. uh, up front that there are people in the church that are are concerned about right what's, what's going on in the in the, in the society mm-hmm. in our country. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, so that certainly gives me encouragement to. Uh, press on right. with, with the issue right. that uh, there are others that 
that feel the same way right. and, and are uh, disturbed by what we're seeing. And <clears throat> um, if I'm not, I could, because I had spoken to people from a few different groups, did you all read um, a few books? Do you read some books within your group? Yes. Okay. Uh, and um, and one, so, one of those, one of the one of the groups, and, uh-huh. and I wasn't. Uh, we we have a series of small groups within our church, uh-huh. and they're they're small discussion groups, which which make it, mm-hmm. which facilitates more more participation than than you would would get in church services. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Do you recall and, some of the books that you well, all have one read? was Ta-Nehisi Coates. Oh, uh-huh. uh huh. Book. Or, mm-hmm. I, I know, uh, even though I wasn't part of the group, mm-hmm. uh, it was. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, his book on reparations, or, mm-hmm. or the case for reparations, I think it was called. Mm-hmm. 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 Well, I really appreciate you talking with me, and I, um, I hope you do see the entire mini series. It's it is hard to watch, and I always tell and, people you yeah. have to get to episode four. You know, because that's that's even that's the hardest to watch, but it's the most right. um, so imp- it's it's so important to see the whole series is, is essential it, to the, see. The but. series that I saw was excellent. Uh-huh. And the, mm-hmm. the episode uh, as far as the movie itself and the way it was presented. Yeah, and it was done very well. Had so. you seen the Ken yeah. Burns documentary when that came out some years ago? Uh, on the uh, he on the uh, Central uh, Park Five? No, I didn't see that. Yeah. No. That's currently on uh, Amazon, but it was out at the movies. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. No, yeah. I didn't see it. And, okay, and and I do intend to watch the other sure. episodes. Yeah, you know, <laughs> and you know, based on your recommendation, I'll I'll uh, press on and go to episode <laughs> four, uh, looking for a uh, a positive thread there. Right, it, it, right. That's ultimately, the, my hope that we we can uh, by reaching out to one another. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, put a lot of the racial uh, tension and, and issues that we've had over our history. Right, us. right, right. Well, Owen, thank you so much. Well, thank I you. really appreciate I, it. I, I appreciate the work you're doing. Thank, thank you. you. The first time I actually started watching it, I maybe got through about 10 to 15 minutes. Mm-hmm. Um, and I was just completely... You know, I mean, it gets into it really quick. Right, <laughs> and, right. And you kind of don't have enough time to process mm-hmm. how fast things are moving. Um, and uh, it, I quickly started to realize that, you know, my blood pressure was going up, my heart rate. I mean, I was, my body mm. temperature was going up and I was, you know, uh, very frustrated and, and, and visibly angry uh, watching the, the episode. And um, there were several times throughout the episode where I had to pause and kind of just leave the, the, the TV Mm-hmm. for a few moments just to kind of get my bearings back together. Do you remember what you were thinking about what you were watching? I, I'm just, just so frustrated that, mm-hmm. and, I, and I think that the, the, uh, the makers of the series did a great job in, in terms of portraying the reality of, of what it was like. You know? And what, what did you know about that whole story? Growing up. So growing up, the only thing that, uh, that I really knew about the story was that, um, these, these five guys, mm-hmm. um, uh, and, and this is the reality mm-hmm. and what our media had fed us. Uh, I believed that these five men or, you know, they're actually children, boys, but, right. You know, the way the media portrayed them to they, be adults, as if they were exactly, as if they were adults, as if they were monsters. Mm-hmm. Um, I believed that these, these five you know, um, kids, uh, you know, raped this, this white woman in Mm -hmm. Central Park and that, um, you know, uh, what happened happened after that. Uh, and it wasn't my place to really question the justice system, Uh Mm -hmm. you know, uh, and you know, growing up, you think the world is an ideal place. You think that, uh, when you talk about law and order in society, you talk about law enforcement, they're supposed to be there to protect us. They're supposed to be there to make sure that our, um, you know, uh, communities are safe. Uh, the justice system is supposed to be there to make sure that nobody gets treated unfairly, that everybody gets a fair trial. Everybody is innocent until proven guilty. But, you know, through my experience uh, and my journey of understanding, um, you know, what it means to be black in America and understanding police brutality and how it affects black communities so deeply and mm-hmm. so, um, uh, endlessly, mm-hmm. um, you know, I 
obviously started to uh, realize and understand that that um, that there's something more to this. Some some uh-huh. during that time, 2012, 2014, mm-hmm. um, and then they were, uh, you know, um, exonerated mm-hmm. and, and uh, proven to not be the perpetrators. Mm-hmm. Um, I, for me, at that moment, it was it was kind of it was and it was right you know, during that time that I was starting to realize that these things are a lot more important and mm-hmm. that I should make them more important in my life. Um, and so, you know, that's when I revisited and realized that whatever I had known to be true about the situation mm-hmm. is completely wrong and inaccurate. Um, and, and so that's how I started my journey of, um, educating myself on, on, uh, as much as I could mm-hmm. and, you know, trying to decipher as much as I could, but nothing really made as big of an impact, I think, as um, just this first episode. Mm-hmm. So I was living in New York at the time, and during during the yeah, actual time, yeah, uh huh. Okay. In 1989, I was living in New York City, and I I had assumed also that you know they were because because they confessed I had assumed they were guilty but I do remember feeling um when Donald Trump put that ad you know the ad in those papers I remember feeling even though they had confessed I still had a a horrible I was horribly offended you know and I felt um you know, they hadn't been tried yet, and I had no reason to think that they weren't Absolutely. guilty, but I still felt some kind of way about that ad. And then when they, when it came out that they were coerced, I thought, um, before I had read the story, and maybe I just saw the headlines or was just hearing it, you know, in the news, and I thought, well, who would do that? How would that happen? And then I started reading I started reading the stories around it and how that happened. And I didn't doubt it. I didn't doubt it at all. You know, it it was just sort of a process through all of these years. And um, so they've just been on such a unbelievable journey and just. Absolutely. (laughs) And it's, it's interesting that you, that you talk about your personal experience of, even though you, you know, initially believed that, Mm-hmm. They did it because they confessed. You still, it did, still didn't sit right with you. Um, and, and I think the, the ad, like, so, well, so, okay. even though I'm thinking they're guilty because they confessed, Donald Trump saying that, and that's, that comes from being in black skin right. to me. Absolutely. You know, it's, this could be, you know, um, a relative or Absolutely. somebody that I know, right. you know, I and mean, he was calling for a national he, lynching of all, right. You're speaking to, to the entire black race, Absolutely. you know, in my opinion, that's how I took it. Absolutely. And, um, and plus they're, they were boys, you know, they children. were children. children, you know, they were, they were children. So it was just something for me that I felt so strongly, even though I thought they were guilty, I felt so strongly about that ad. Right. And then um, it was, a, and even when, I, like I said, even when I heard they confessed, I was like, what? Really? I don't know about that. Right. But then when I started reading about it and saw how right. that happened, I absolutely believed it. Absolutely. So, and that's the, that's the, the, the monster or, or the snake or the devil or whatever you want to call it. That is white supremacy. It has even embedded itself into the the minds and the psyche of people of color, regardless of whether you're black or non-black, um, it, it it has embedded itself in our psyche and we question our own selves. We question our own communities. We question our own loved ones, uh, in these situations, um, you know, because, uh, that's what they've always wanted us to believe. Right. They've always wanted Mm -hmm. us to separate the humanity from black people in America and, look at them as if they were subhuman. And that's why for me, uh, when it comes to race, and I've had my, you know, encounters growing up, and it's, I don't feel, uh, 
I don't feel the offense. You know, I take the personal offense. You know, I'm human, of course, but I feel it like if you have uh, racism in you, for me, you're talking about my family. You're talking about my parents. Right. My mother, my father, my brothers, right. my grandparents. Absolutely. You know, so that's where my um, my pushback comes from because you're talking about people that I love and this is how you're perceiving them. Right. You know, so. Uh, <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, I think that's that's an interesting point that you make there, you know, because um it, the reality of of the black experience in America is that this entire country was built by African slaves. Right. Mm-hmm. It was built on the backs mm-hmm. and the blood and tears and sweat of mm-hmm. African slaves. And um and and knowing that the prosperity of what is America today is because of that, mm-hmm. um, it, it makes it that much more um, it makes it that much more difficult to digest mm-hmm. when somebody has those moments of whether it's individual or systemic mm-hmm. uh, moments of racism uh, or racial behavior, uh, you know, um, racially motivated mm-hmm. uh, acts of violence or behavior uh, is is that you know whether regardless of how you feel about mm-hmm. black people, which you know technically um, you know you shouldn't be racist <laughs> um, at the very least to understand the history of America, that what you have today in America is the passing down of generational wealth from white family to white family to white family because of the hard work and the, 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 the physical mm-hmm. work that right. African slaves mm-hmm. um, had Put to in. endure mm-hmm. uh, against their will. Right. So to not even acknowledge and appreciate that aspect of their experience and to still uh, dehumanize and and put that entire group of people down, um, you know, I, I, I can't even imagine what it's like to to hear, you know, racial slurs or, uh, you know, uh, anything derogatory towards my entire community, because I would feel that that's an mm-hmm. attack on my family. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I can't, I can't, you know, imagine how deeply that, that must have felt for you. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, because, you know, when I, when I, as an Indian person, uh, when I talk about my, um, when I talk about my community, I look at my community as a family. Right. You know, I look at my community as my family. And of course, if somebody says something about my family, you're saying something about just like you right. felt. You're exactly. saying something about my mother. You're saying mm-hmm. something about my father, my grandparents, my mm-hmm. sister. Um, but but our our experience has been completely different from mm-hmm. the black experience. Mm-hmm. You know, we didn't have to go through slavery the way that black people had to go through. We didn't have to go through segregation that the way that black people had to. We didn't have to go through in America the way that black people ex- have experienced the American experience. Mm-hmm. That has never happened for my community. You know? Uh so I can't imagine uh what when you say that that is an attack on my family. Mm-hmm. The the depth to how deeply that goes into your core as a human being and into Mm -hmm. your soul. Mm -hmm. I I, I can't even imagine. (laughs) I mean, that must be the most hurtful. And I I mean, I I don't, I I don't have words. It's a, it's a combination of, um, hurt and anger, you know, because of a protection, you know, that I feel towards my family or that a person would feel. Absolutely. So it's a, it's a combination of feelings. Um, you, did you say, um, that you had some encounter, you had an encounter, um, with authorities at one time when they met, they, I've had multiple, (laughs) really, (laughs) I have, yes, not very many people know this. Um, but when I, it was, I guess it was around 2007, I was, um, going to, um, I was, uh, driving home, uh, and, 
I was in this part of Atlanta, uh, in, in Kennesaw. Mm-hmm. Um, and I had to be completely honest, I had never been into that area before. Um, maybe once or twice mm-hmm. before that. And I was just driving home. It was late at night and these two white kids in their car, uh, just came out of nowhere and started to try to race me. And when I declined to do so, really, um, they tried to run me off the road and then they tried to, um, you know, uh, hit my car. Uh, really? and they tried and I, and I felt in that moment, I'm not supposed to be here. What, what time of, um, night was it? I it was probably around 11, uh-huh. 10 to 11 ish. I would say you thought, um, you thought I'm not supposed to be here in this town oh, right yeah. now. Immediately. Mm-hmm. As soon as they started wow. swerving their car toward me, I was like, Oh, I, and then because of what I had seen on my way in, uh-huh. you know, there was mostly white people in the area. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I, and I realized that, uh, this is probably not somewhere that I need to be. And, uh, I should probably get out of here as quickly as possible. Well, so they started doing that. So I thought in my mind that if I slow down or stop my car, that'll probably get me killed because who knows what they're capable of. Mm -hmm. Uh, if I stop my car, what if they stop their car too? Then I'm just, Mm -hmm. it's an open invitation to come and harass me or, you know, uh, potentially even kill me. Right. Um, And, you know, when you're a person of color in America, uh, you don't have to hear the words to be, to know what the motivation is behind how you're being treated. Mm -hmm. Um, it's, it's based off the action Mm -hmm. and the communication that you get from the Mm -hmm. messages that they're sending verbally, non-verbally, whatever it may be. Um, and so I knew that I wasn't in the right place. Um, and you know, so I, instead of stopping because I felt like if, if I had stopped that I would uh-huh. probably, I don't know what the outcome would be. I started to speed up mm-hmm. and just tried to outrun them and get out of their way, get onto the interstate as fast as I could. So that way I could get home. Um, and I don't know why I didn't think about calling the police, mm-hmm. <laughs> but you know, yeah, your don't really adrenaline's up. You're just trying to get up, to get out of there. Yeah. My adrenaline was up. I was uh-huh. scared. I was uh-huh. terrified. And you know, I, I had also heard of stories, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, before that about police interaction with people of color. Mm -hmm. So, you know, uh, I kind of had a mixture of, you know, why I made the choices that I made. Uh, And then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, um, I see these, you know, flashing lights uh, and the two guys in their car, they kind of just swerved off and took a turn down another road. And <laughs> this I know sounds that, like a typical movie scene. Uh, oh my uh, goodness. Yes. Oh my gosh. <laughs> it, was, it was, it was so scary. And I, I saw them, you know, and I know that the, the cop lights came on because of what was going on. I mean, I had no doubt in my that mind. That they saw both of the cars. Absolutely. Uh-huh. There was no way that they would have seen me speeding and not the other car because uh-huh. we were neck and neck mm-hmm. and they were swerving, trying to hit me and all this kind of stuff. Uh, so when they swerved off and turned down a random street, the cop kept going uh, and I had gotten over a hill and had pulled into the left-hand turning lane because I was trying to get onto the street, the road that would take me to the interstate. Uh-huh. Uh, and the cop you know, came down the hill and was going, it was a red light and he was going through the red light and realized that I was in the left-hand turning lane. So he slammed on his brakes and waited for me to turn. And as soon as I turned, he got behind me and I pulled over into a parking lot. Mm. And I mean, he came out of his door, guns drawn. Oh my goodness. Um, and he was a white cop. Uh Um, he came out of his door, guns drawn Uh and, uh, made me stick my hands out the window and, uh, called for backup. And then when backup came, which was uh, multiple cops, um, they uh, came up to my window and, uh, uh, well, sorry, before the the backup came, he, you know, um, asked me, you know, uh, why uh, I was speeding and what the heck I'm doing in this area. I mean, to ask a person of color (laughs) what What? you're doing in this neighborhood. Right. Right. Uh-huh. You know, my gosh, <laughs> I was, I was, tr- I was terrified. I was mm-hmm. shaking. I was scared. Um, you know, and, and, uh, and I, and no matter what I did, you know, it was just like a, no, you know, I'm not believing what you're saying. So then, you know, backup comes and then, uh, they pull me out. Really? The window and they didn't, the at, they didn't say get out of the car. They no. pulled you out. No. Well, I mean, I, 
they may have said something about getting out of the car, <laughs> but I was so scared that yeah, I, yeah. I mean, nothing was making sense to yeah, me. Yeah, Because why am I? Because uh-huh. in my in my mind, my reality is that th- that these two white guys were trying to kill me or do something to mm-hmm. harm me. Mm-hmm. So why am I the one that's here? Right. Being restrained. Mm-hmm. Why not those two guys? Are there cops following them right now? Mm-hmm. Are they being arrested? Like what's going on? Um, and so uh, yeah, so they pulled me out of the window and, and put me to the ground and, and arrested me. And no uh, kidding. there were several cops who made several racial slurs about my skin color. Uh, I think one of them, um, I, I don't know if it was one of the cops that was there as backup or if it was the cop that was driving me to the police station. I, it was just such a huge mm-hmm. blur. I don't remember, but I, I, I remember being called a, a racial slur that is often associated with people from the Middle East, uh, along with also being called a terrorist. Um, and that was, that was a traumatic experience. Yeah, I'm sure I was terrified. And that was, you know, even, even, uh, going through that, I was still, you know, as I mentioned, Uh I really kind of started to wake up when I was right. Right. So I kind of suppressed all of that. Oh my gosh. That's a lot to suppress. I had no, and, and nobody came to my side. Nobody came to my side to believe me. In to, terms of the police. To hear what I had to say. Well, definitely not the police, but also in, um, you know, in my family, uh, because mm-hmm. there was just this inherent, you know, and this goes back to, you know, the, the immigrant experience in America, especially if you're non-black, is that... You must have done something. It, it, exactly. That the police are there to protect us. They're, they're, they can never do any harm and that they're never wrong. Uh, so it must have been me. Oh, it must have been me. Uh, and I'll tell you this, uh, and, uh, and, you know, hopefully my dad doesn't hear this, <laughs> but, you know, he, he needs to. Um, you know, when I, uh, it's so funny. I called, when I called home, because mm-hmm. uh, it give you that phone call to call whoever right. you need to call mm-hmm. uh, after, you know, two or three hours or whatever it was after processing me and letting me sleep in the cold holding cell <laughs> on the floor with nothing. Mm. Um, they let me call home. So I called my dad. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, and I was terrified because, you know, my dad has been very strict growing up. Yeah. Uh, and so I called home and I told my dad, well, first of all, he was shocked to hear that I was calling him that late. It was probably around one or two uh-huh. o'clock in the morning at this point. And so, um, I, I, my dad asked what I'm doing and I said, well, I'm, I've been arrested and mm-hmm. I'm in jail. And he asked where I was. Um, and, uh, and he basically just said, good, stay there, and just hung up the phone on me. <laughs> oh, no. Uh, and, and, you know, as as angry as I was at that time for him, for my own father doing yeah. that, you know, now looking back on it, I, I understand. Not that it makes it right, uh-huh. but I understand because that is a very common uh, okay, reaction and reaction in, your, in, with, your in the South culture. Asian community, mm-hmm. absolutely, um, is to you know, just like the, the white communities do in America is to give police the benefit of the doubt mm-hmm. that they're there Everybody to serve has and their way us. Exactly. In there. Uh-huh. Uh, and so it must have been my fault. And I think if, uh, in many aspects, even to this day, I don't think he still really understands and gets the, 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 how long the were you there? Of it. Uh, well that, you know, I called back, I called mom this time, <laughs> <laughs> you know, moms are right. Are, Softer. <laughs> not trying to put any labels on, uh-huh. on women or, or mothers, <laughs> but uh, from what I have experienced in my family, uh-huh. the women have, have always been more compassionate. Uh-huh. Um, so my mom answered and I told her what happened. And, um, you know, she talked to my dad, obviously, and then they mm-hmm. came to get me. And the first thing my dad said to me was like, uh, he said, um, I never thought that I would see this day and you made me see it. The fact that I got arrested, mm-hmm. that was such a big no, no, uh-huh. uh, you know, community wise, like, Oh my gosh, now, you know, now my, my now I have to tell people my son was arrested, mm-hmm. which he never had to tell anybody, <laughs> uh, but you know, there, there's no shame in, in, uh-huh. in, 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 in that, especially considering that, you know, yeah. What happened to you? Right. What uh-huh. happened, you know? And, um, luckily I was able to, you know, we had to, we had to hire a lawyer because I felt so strongly about the situation. They, they charged me for reckless driving and speeding and endangerment. Didn't they have cameras? And Did they? This was 2007. Uh-huh. There were cameras were yeah, not, especially in not Kennesaw. In, yeah. You know, in a small town like Kennesaw. So, wow. And yeah. so they dropped it or? 
Well, what? he was able to get the reckless driving reduced to speeding. And so I had to pay, it was like, at the time it was like an $800 fine. And then I had to pay a thousand dollars on top of that to the lawyer. And I mean, it was mm. just, and so, you know, I had to pay that off. All of that, off of these two guys, of this other car, just trying to. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. And, and they probably drove off. Right. Thinking nothing of it. Uh huh. And they're probably living their lives, not even knowing. Right what had happened, you know, and, and that's, that also speaks to the, the, um, you know, going back to when they see us, you know, um, when, when that happened and the news broke and, and media was reporting what happened in Central Park that night and what these kids allegedly did, mm-hmm. um, you know, uh, for most of America, for most of white America, it was just one of those things that, oh, another story of, you know, another group of black kids mm-hmm. doing something wrong right because right that's, right that's what they do right uh and then they just move on as if that was nothing mm-hmm. uh you know uh, th- that was nothing to 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 dwell on you mm-hmm. know um and, and uh you know i think that i think that there comes a point in um in our um existence as people, especially as people of color in, living in a dominating society that is white, um, there comes a point in our existence when we have to say, you know, all the stories that we're hearing, everything that we ex- that we see that's going on in the news, um, the sensationalizing of uh, of of black people as criminals and as drug addicts and all these different things, um, and then now we're in an era of you know. Luckily, because people have, you know, uh, been able to uh, get their voices heard uh, and, you know, uh, you know, because of the protests and Mm -hmm. all these large movements like Black Lives Matter and uh, some other organizations that are doing really good work to bring attention and light to these issues that have always been going on. But right the media never really cared because the response was uh, there were no cell phone cameras. Well, yeah, yeah, that as well. Technology mm-hmm. was, wasn't mm-hmm. available. Uh, and you know, the general consensus because of what media kept portraying, uh, was that, Oh, this is another day in, you know, mm-hmm. in, in America, this is what happens all the time. And, and, and when the, when the conversation shifted from that to look, it's not about this, it's about, the experience of what it means to be black in America, like police brutality is not, Mm -hmm. it's not that it's not normal because it's, it's always been normal. You know, let's talk about the, the, the history of law enforcement. Mm -hmm. Police were created solely for, for the fact that when slaves ran away from, you know, the plantations, uh, law enforcement was created as a means to go find them and bring them back, Mm -hmm. you know, and Mm -hmm. that DNA has never left law enforcement, mm-hmm. you know? Um, and, and so, uh, when, when we look at, uh, these issues of policing and police brutality and, uh, you know, the fact that black people are looked at as criminals first and then mm-hmm. whatever else, and the way the media portrays them as criminals and having past records and, you know, being drug, whatever it may be, mm-hmm. uh, compared to, you know, people who are white who, you know, do heinous things in society, but they're always portrayed as loving father or Mm -hmm. uh, a friendly neighbor or don't, we don't know where this came from, you know, Mm -hmm. uh, just, you know, all of these things combined, uh, you know, uh, um, you know, speaking about um, issues related to specifically with police and, and what goes back to when they see us is that, uh, you know, nobody questioned the police through all of this, mm-hmm. you know, uh, in terms of, 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 uh, you know, what happened. No, yes, they were questioned because they had to go through, mm-hmm. um, the, the judicial process. But, uh, what I meant, what I mean by nobody questioned them is nobody questioned what they said, what they had to say. Everybody questioned those five innocent children, right? whatever right. they said. Everything was scrutinized, looked at over and over again, deconstructed, torn apart, ripped in half, uh, and and ultimately looked at as lies, which well, is what led to them being in prison. Yeah, and I hope you see the the rest of the miniseries because it's um, there were definitely holes 
holes in the case. Oh, absolutely. And um, uh, one of the reasons that I think everyone should see it uh, is also to get to episode four, because episode four is very hard to watch, but okay. it's um, it's something that must be seen. Absolutely, it, it really it must it must be seen. Absolutely, and um, and th- I, it's my understanding from looking at uh, interviews of the um, of the five men that there are depositions that are under seal. Mm-hmm. For a certain, you know, I don't know how many years and that I don't know if it's going to be a rolling out when the depositions will be available or they'll all be available at whatever year. But more is co- going to come out, I think, about the um, cover up since they were exonerated Absolutely. and or as they were looking into as that new investigation was being done, you know, be, you know, a cover up by the prosecutors Absolutely. and the police. So this isn't over from from what I understand. Absolutely. And it's really interesting that you mentioned that because, um, you know, uh, I was actually also thinking uh, when I was watching or maybe right after watching that first episode is that, you know, they're and I know and I know that they have these depositions that are still and a lot of evidence and data that still has not mm-hmm. been, um, you know, uh, allowed to to see the public eye yet. And it's interesting, you know, that they do this. Why do you think law enforcement does this? I don't know. It's because they know that there are holes in the story. You mean, it's, why do I think that they have an under seal? Absolutely, why did the yes. courts do it? You right. mean? Yeah. Why yeah. The court, yeah. Uh-huh. Do, why, why the, ju- ju- the justice uh-huh. system puts uh-huh. it under seal is because they know that the prosecution's case was not strong. Uh, they know that there, well, but there we've was. already learned that. I mean, they've been exonerated. Absolutely. So I really don't know why. So, right. So now seal. it's exactly <laughs> now it's kind of just like, why not? Mm-hmm. They've already been exonerated. There's no evidence to prove or suggest otherwise. Uh, so why are we still holding mm-hmm. back all this information right, and right. withholding? Um, but but this is what they this is what the judicial system and the justice system has done for a, a very long time, you know, especially when it comes to cases of people of color and and black people um, who have been accused of certain types of crimes or even certain crimes in general, um, is that uh, everything is off limits until. A future date, mm-hmm. uh, and I and I and, and, and I can't help but imagine that that's done specifically and strategically, in a way to 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 allow for that generation of people who are questioning, to kind of leave, retire and die, retire and die, <laughs> so that way when this yeah. information does uh-huh. become available, yeah, nobody cares about yeah. it, yeah, 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 and, and and that's another point is that uh you know uh kept recurring in my mind uh watching that first episode was uh why is nobody um why is nobody understanding you know that that these kids cannot be uh guilty unless they have hard evidence right unless they have hard evidence why are they automatically presuming them to be guilty. And that's the story of America. That's mm-hmm. the story of, of, of being black in America is that mm-hmm. you're automatically, um, uh, you know, ascribed, um, the, the label of being guilty, mm-hmm. you know, and I often say this to, to, you know, people when I talk about this is that in America, you know, you're, if you're white, you're, you're innocent until proven guilty, but if you're black, you're guilty until proven. Innocent. Right. Uh, and, and, and that's not something that was, specific to just this case mm-hmm. uh, of the exonerated five, but also to every single oh, yeah. other case yeah. in America. And that's what a lot of people um, have brought up to me. Something else I wanted to bring up before we, before we close, but, um, but other people have brought up to me that this is one case and that there's many, there's many others, but what a case, you know, absolutely there are other cases, but what a case. You know, I'm just so glad that this happened. I'm so grateful that that they've been exonerated, that this has been proven. This story has been told. It's that it's staying in the the public eye, right. you know, in the public minds. I'm just so grateful for that. Yeah, I, I mean, it would have been better 
had this not ever even happened. Absolutely. But um, the lessons that we have learned mm-hmm. from, well, lessons. And, that and I, the I, sacrifices that, that they've made. Oh, my gosh. Not willingly. Oh, my gosh. But, I mean, they've sacrificed, you know, a major part of their lives. Their entire lives. And and souls, you know. Absolutely. And, and, and you know, the, the amount of... Um, emotion and feeling and pain and struggle and mm-hmm. uh you know just the sheer and, and and raw um magnitude of of understanding for themselves as black men this is what it means to be a black man in america for them to come to that realization at such as an babies. early age exactly yeah. mm-hmm. for them to come yes. to that realization at such an early age yeah. and then to live the greater part of their entire life behind mm-hmm. bars, knowing mm-hmm. that they were innocent right. and had not done anything, um, just shows that you know America, you know, has has never really uh, has never really cared. Right. And and, and I, I would I would say you know uh, it's important for for people within the Black community to know. I want you to know that you know there are those of us who stand in solidarity um, and are willing to put ourselves. Mm-hmm. Um, wherever you need us, mm-hmm. wherever you need us to, to do and to do whatever you want us and whatever you need us to do. Mm-hmm. Um, because, because, uh, it, it's, it's, it's just not fair that we get to benefit, um, uh, from everything that your family and your ancestors have, mm-hmm. have, have worked so hard for, um, when a, a large majority uh, uh, a vast, overwhelming majority of of, um, of the Black experience in America is uh, doesn't have access to those same benefits, mm-hmm. um, and and it's it's crucial also in this particular time when we are being divided um, even more than you know uh, we thought possible in this time mm-hmm. you know because again nothing has really ever changed in America you know racism just keep, keeps getting repackaged into a different form. Mm-hmm. First it was slavery, then, you know, Jim Crow, segregation, <laughs> you know, then the, the war on drugs, mm-hmm. then mass incarceration, and now it's police brutality. You know, it's it, it, it's time for non-black people of color to wake up and understand that uh, if we don't get involved, then this is also going to be our uh, fate as well, mm-hmm. uh, especially because of, who's in yeah. power now, mm-hmm. the mm-hmm. kind of ideologies that are being propagated throughout America mm-hmm. and the acceptance of these ideas uh, as, as, as freedom of speech. Has that been considered um, in conversation in your community? I don't think at, um, at uh, no, mm-hmm. I don't think so. I don't think so. I think that, um, I think that most people in, in, in the South Asian community and most communities, intra communities within the South Asian, uh, the broader South Asian community. So you have Indian people, Bangladeshi people, Pakistani people, Nepali people, Sri Lankan people. I think that, um, that most people, uh, uh are separated from that conversation. And I think that they are, um, I don't want to say, I don't want to use the term oblivious, but uh, there are those, <laughs> but you can live in a cocoon. I can see where you can live a co- in a cocoon within those communities. Absolutely, I can see that. And, and uh, it's taken, and, I, and 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 it's a tragedy and a travesty that that it, this has to happen. But um, you know, now I'm starting to see some of my other Indian friends become involved and engaged because of what's going on in their communities. For example, some of my um, Muslim friends who may not have really thought about racial injustice, um, you know, now that, you know, uh, Muslim people ha- have been under attack mm-hmm. by this administration, right. mm-hmm. uh, being called terrorists and mm-hmm. the Muslim ban, the travel on mm-hmm. the travel ban on Muslims and um, the, the mosque that was mm-hmm. attacked. And, you know, uh, they're starting to see, you know, see and realize, you know what, maybe, maybe there is something to, <laughs> the way we see and perceive mm-hmm. uh, America. Maybe it's not that mm-hmm. that beacon that we have always thought it to be. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and, and 
here we are. We've had a, uh, an entire you know, community of people telling us for the last 400 years that the America that America portrays itself to be is not the America that, mm -hmm. you know, it should be, or at least maybe have wanted to be mm -hmm. at, on the outset right, of its, right, of its um, right. establishment, you know, I mean, think about this I mean, is a completely different topic, you know, mm -hmm. but, you know, think about the, the, the way this country even started, you know, the, the massacre of yeah, 30 million I Native know. Americans. I've been thinking about, you know? I think about that often and in, in this conversation too. I mean, that's, that is, that's wild. I mean, to, and horror, it's, that's a horror. So right. you, you remove people from their land and then you bring enslaved people. Right. You know, that's, um, so that's the foundation and that's why there's a need to talk about this stuff. Absolutely. You know, I mean, because otherwise it doesn't get fleshed out. And I, I see it as, you know, just like um, if we're working on our own issues and there's like dark sides of ourselves that, you know, we don't want to look at, you know, I mean, I have that, you know, that I've worked through. It's Absolutely. like it's the same thing. It's like the dark side of, you know, our our American culture that we have to continue to look at absolutely you know and and flesh out absolutely. so that we can heal right um you know so that it's there's nothing wrong with talking about this absolutely. stuff absolutely absolutely not and, and and that that also speaks to you know the fact that you know the the reason why we're so apathetic to these issues in America is because we've been taught a certain way mm -hmm. we've been told a different version of history Mm -hmm. that is not real, that did not happen, uh, you know, when it comes to Native Americans, the indigenous people that were here on this land before. Uh, and uh, and we also have not been told the reality of, of the, the, um, the, the stealing mm -hmm. of, of an entire people mm -hmm. from another continent mm -hmm. to bring here mm -hmm. and what those experiences were. The storytelling and the sharing of information you know, the, 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 the black experience of what it means to be black in America is a story that's only been passed down through black families. Right. Because in white America, that reality doesn't exist. Right. And, and honestly, in many black families, it's, um, the story, you know, a lot of us don't know the history of our families. Right. Um, There's you that know, as well. we only know like the and t so now in recent years, I guess, you know, now, um, you know, ancestry, researching your ancestry is very right. popular. But um, even in my own family and um, I knew my mother's side, but not my father's side and never um, beyond my uh, grandmother b wow. beyond my grandparents. Now I know a great deal, right. but I didn't know there was so much I didn't know when my father was living right. that I could have just asked, right? You know, and didn't. And so, um, and so, you know, his many of his siblings are gone, grandparents are gone, and so we had to really, really go digging, right. and that's not uncommon. Oh, in the absolutely. black community, right? You know, some people they do. You know, I'm you know I'm not. This is a generalization, but I know it's not uncommon. Absolutely. You know, some people absolutely they can go back generations, but it affects your your identity. Absolutely, and um, it's it's really something like in in my family, uh, both both grandparents on both sides came from North Carolina, but on my father's side, um, they were in a they were brought over from Scotland. You know his his. Um, these this family same last name came over from Scotland they settled in North Carolina and then you go down the generations you can see when you know great 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 grandparents and all of that right. and so there's a cemetery it's a small town and there's a cemetery where their graves are and so to go there and you know see the graves and it's such an intimate cemetery too i mean it's it's really powerful right. you know so you do you are empowered and you feel connected and, um, you know, in a spiritual way. And right. so it's, um, it is something, you know, to right. discover these things. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, no. And, and that I'm, I'm, I can't even imagine how transformative, uh, mm -hmm. of an experience that is, uh, 
you know, and, but then I, on the, on the flip side, I also think about all of the, the, the slaves, um, who were buried in unmarked graves, right? Who may have children and, and, Absolutely. and descendants who don't know, right? Not even, not only, not only do they not know the lineage of their family, but they don't even know where their family is buried. Mm-hmm. I, that to me, I mean, I can't imagine it because it's not something that's ever been, that's mm-hmm. ever affected my community, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. you know? Um, and, 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 and for us as, as a country to ignore that, not just specifically that, but the entire experience of, mm-hmm. of what it means to be black in America. Um, I think it's just, uh, you know, after 400 years, I think it's way past time. It's mm-hmm. been long overdue that we have these conversations mm-hmm. and we can only learn from each other if we keep talking. Right. Um, if we keep talking, we keep sharing information. We keep educating. Um, uh, that's the only way I think that mm-hmm. that we can um, even hope to encounter any type of progress. Um, and without that, without the stories that Ava DuVernay mm-hmm. is 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 uh, portraying in um, uh, When They See Us and all these other shows and and movies that are mm-hmm. coming out. And, and uh, going back to that point, you know, I was talking about the the shows in the '90s. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, at that time, it was important for us to to as America to see that. Oh well, there's nothing really different about right being black. Mm-hmm. You know, even though there is, mm-hmm. there's a, a lot that's different. But at the same time, the point was to humanize and and let people know that we have the same sensibilities. Exactly, we all exactly. Do. Mm-hmm. We're all human. We mm-hmm. all have the same sensibilities. We all care about mm-hmm. the same things. Uh, you know, now, you know, when we see uh, TV shows and movies with you know um, black families. Uh, or black lead characters, mm-hmm. um, you know, the, the, the conversation has shifted. It's not about um, uh, uh, normalizing and humanizing black families anymore. It's about explaining and portraying the reality of it, what it means to be in America in its rawest and truest form. Right. Because clearly that approach mm-hmm. didn't work in the 90s. Right. Or in, in the 80s. In the 80s mm-hmm. and 90s, that approach didn't work. Mm-hmm. Um it was important. Mm-hmm. It it laid down the foundation and the groundwork, mm-hmm. but it wasn't enough. And now we're at a, at a point in time when we have the ability to show and depict, um, you know, what it's like to be black in America. Uh, and I think that that's that right. platform. It's very raw. It's very raw, mm-hmm. but it is so important, especially it in is. this current time. It is. Um, so again. Thank you so much. Oh, thank for you. For be a part of this. Thank you. Uh, I, I, I really appreciate um, you letting me uh, express my perspective and to, um, to uh, hopefully, you know, not necessarily be an inspiration, but at least if you someone are an else inspiration. Can, can hear this who is also Indian, who is, who, or who may be non-black. Uh, and again, I'm not the only one out there. There's mm-hmm. plenty of us, mm-hmm. uh, but definitely not enough. Thank you. Thank you so much for letting me be part of this conversation today. Um, and I look forward to our next meeting. As do I. (laughs) Thanks so much. Thank you. Once again, that was Chirag Patel and Chirag will return for an upcoming episode on Let's Start Healing when he will share his Hindu faith and his spiritual path. Our guests before Chirag Owen Janeway can be reached via email if you would like information on the race reconciliation group that he talked about at his church. Maybe you'd like to know how to start one or if you're in the Atlanta area, you would like to join that group. He can be reached at Owen Janeway at BellSouth.net. That's O-W-E-N-J-A-N-E-W-A-Y at BellSouth.net. He and I chatted about another group healing the racial divide and the leader of that group is Steven Zaludek. You can reach Steven at Z-A-L-O-U-D-E-K-L-A-W at yahoo.com. That's Zaludek Law at yahoo.com. And I would love to know how this episode landed for you. Did it resonate? Did someone bring up something that struck a particular chord? Let me know. Send me an email 
at Let's Start Healing Podcast at gmail.com. Also, like us on Facebook, follow us on Instagram, and you can listen to all of our podcasts on our YouTube channel and on Apple Podcasts. See you soon. In the meantime, let's start healing.